SCOTUS decided an important case this week. Timms v. Indiana asked the question whether the state and local governments should have the right to seize property without limit. And the Supreme Court ruled unanimously that the Eighth Amendment says that they don't have that power. Forcing the forfeiture of a $42,000 vehicle for possession of less than $300 worth of heroin is excessive according to the court. In other news, Jesse Smollett was charged with felony disorderly conduct for filing a false police report. The judge presiding over his bail hearing assigned a $100,000 bond and required that he surrender his passport to the court. Quite a sum of money for a crime that is punishable by a maximum of three years in prison and a fine of less than $10,000. It's been a while since I made a video about constitutional amendments. The Eighth Amendment was the next one that I wanted to cover, so I read up on the amendment and these two cases. Why is it that a $42,000 forfeiture in the Tim's case is an excessive fine, but the $100,000 bail set in the Smollett case is not excessive? I looked, and I think that it's time for some roasted opinions. The Eighth Amendment reads as follows. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. It's a principle of common law which predates the United States. Bail must be set at an amount appropriate for the crime and for the criminal. Fines must be appropriate to the crime and only the crime, without regard to the criminal's financial status. Punishments assigned to crimes must likewise be appropriate to that crime, but not designed to punish the criminal in cruel or unusual ways. The principle dates back to the punishment of Titus Oates, a Protestant cleric during the chaotic period after the English Civil War, who swore out a document to the court, which was a tissue of lies. His perjury resulted in the execution of 22 men on false charges of treason against the crown. The judge noted that executing Oates for his crimes would discourage other true witnesses from coming forward. So Oates was spared. His punishment was commuted to life imprisonment, but with a twist. Every year he would be brought out of prison and placed in a pillory for two days so that the public could hurl abuse and rotten food at him. And then he would be stripped and tied to a cart which was driven through the heart of London while he was whipped. Individually, each of these punishments was perfectly legal at the time, but when combined, they were so excessive that he was pardoned and given a pension a few years later by William III after the Glorious Revolution. The pension was necessary not to compensate him for what he had suffered. The king, in fact, thought that his perjury, leading to 22 counts of judicial murder, was heinous. His reputation was utterly destroyed, though, and the pension allowed the reviled Oates, whom no one would hire or associate with, to survive. When North America was colonized, the settlers brought this principle of law with them. In order for a punishment to be just, it must match the magnitude of the crime. Neither more than nor less than the damage inflicted upon others by the criminal. That's the principle enshrined in the Eighth Amendment. The criminal court system is there to keep the peace, punishing criminals for their crimes and letting their penalties serve as a deterrent against future crime, but also to allow the criminal to think about their crimes and reform their conduct so that they can contribute to society again if possible. Criminal justice is not to be used as a weapon against unwanted elements in society, nor wielded casually and excessively against those who may have committed a crime. It is also not meant to be used as a political device. Now, Tim's pled guilty to dealing drugs for the heroin he sold to undercover police. Does the fact that he was a drug user mean that he shouldn't be punished or that we should let criminals keep the proceeds of their crimes? Um, no. Just, no. Tim's was sentenced to a year of house arrest, five years probation, and a $1,200 fine. He wasn't a career drug dealer, though. The Land Rover seized by Indiana was purchased using life insurance money after his dad died, not the proceeds of his drug dealing. In criminal cases, seizing property which was either obtained by the criminal activity or integral to that criminal activity being perpetrated is acceptable practice. 
In the Tim's case, though, the Land Rover was not purchased with drug money, and Tim's did not need or use it solely to deal drugs. This was his personal vehicle, and losing it meant that after he completed his house arrest, he had to borrow a car to find a job and get back to work. In other words, Tim's learned his lesson, got clean and sober, and found a way to rejoin society as a productive member. And the loss of that vehicle, more than four times the value of the maximum fine assigned for his crime, constituted an excessive fine. But Roast, isn't the Jesse Smollett case just another example of this? No, it's not. Smollett and Tim's aren't in the same position at all, and bail is different than fines. Bail is meant to assure attendance by the accused to the proceedings of the court, and it is returned by the courts to the person charged after the court case is over. It's a monetary pledge that the accused will respect the jurisdiction of the court, which is why bail can be incredibly high for relatively small crimes. If convicted, Smollett will likely get the bulk of his bail restored to him. His passport may be revoked by the State Department, but the court will certainly return it to him. The judge in the hearing set the bail that high because Smollett was earning $60,000 per episode for his work on the series Empire. He appeared in 75 episodes over the course of the series, which even though his per-episode pay started at $20,000, means that he has made over $2 million from just that series. His net worth is estimated at at least $1 million, so setting bail at about 10% of that and making him surrender his passport is not an excessive amount for him. Rather, it's intended to make sure that he does not flee the country. The biggest penalty which he will face for the hoax if he is convicted is being fired and blacklisted by Hollywood, not the criminal sentencing and that blacklisting is something which is likely to happen if the other investigation results in charges against Smollett as well. Oh yeah, remember? He's also being investigated by the FBI for mailing a threatening letter to the set of Empire which contained crushed aspirin, and that will land Smollett in much more trouble if he is charged and convicted. While he may not be charged for the letter or convicted of either crime, I don't think that anyone in the entertainment industry will want to work with him again. Society typically withdraws from people who have committed crimes. That is its own punishment, and the Founding Fathers knew this. It's common knowledge that Smollett will likely be a pariah in the industry. And no one had to look up Titus Oates to know that he was a pariah after his release. Smollett will have to rebuild his career or start over after the investigations, court cases, and possible punishments are done, just as Tim's is now attempting to do. Giving them a chance to do so without ruining them entirely is a good thing. It means that they have a chance to learn, grow, and reform their behavior to become productive members of society again. What the Supreme Court decided was that the Eighth Amendment applies to the states too. This is an affirmation of two other important clauses, the Supremacy Clause within the original Constitution and the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. They didn't decide that seizures were illegal in all cases. They merely stated that the limitations placed upon the federal government also apply to lesser jurisdictions. It was an easy decision, in my humble opinion, which is why the vote was unanimous. Looking back at the Eighth Amendment, I realized something. It really didn't take that many words for the Founding Fathers to apply common sense restraint to the criminal justice system, did it? There's a lesson or two for others in that, I think. Maybe Congress should consider if they really need to write bills that are longer than war and peace. And maybe we should all consider whether or not we want the criminal justice system to be turned into a political weapon against others with whom we just don't agree. Now that's just my opinion. Comment below to share yours. If you like this video, like it and share it, and then check out my other videos and these channels I have subscribed for more great content. Subscribers, make sure that you check your YouTube settings if you want to be notified, and ring that bell.